Hey, it's Brian with a quick announcement before we get started. You know, this time of year especially, we're always aware of how quickly time flies. So let me suggest to you that it's not too early to start thinking now about your Christmas shopping for 2022. And I've got the perfect recommendation for all the Christmas lovers in your life. Christmas Past The Book is coming in the fall of 2022 from Lions Press. Stay connected with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates on events, giveaways, pre-ordering, publication dates, all that stuff. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. Hey everyone, if you're listening in real time, today is the day after Thanksgiving. And that means two things. Number one, you're probably still full from yesterday. And number two, the Christmas season is officially upon us. The radio stations have switched to their all-Christmas formats, Christmas specials are appearing on TV, and you're probably revisiting some of your favorite Christmas stories in one form or another. Me, I have a large collection of Christmas stories on vinyl record, and I'll be curling up with some of them along with a mug of cocoa and a candy cane in the coming chilly evenings. But the great thing about each passing season is the chance to discover something new that may go on to become a new favorite. And that old and largely forgotten tradition of Christmas ghost stories is fertile ground for anyone digging for a spooky festive treat from a bygone time. We love our Christmas stories here on Christmas Past. I've read several of them to you before, and today I'll bring another. It's The Doll's Ghost, which sounds super creepy right off the bat. It's an 1896 story from F. Marion Crawford. I think you'll enjoy it, but I think I'm going to enjoy it more. And that's because I'm going to read it to you from a new and beautifully designed edition. My friends at Biblioasis were kind enough to send me copies from the 2021 edition of Seth's Christmas Ghost Stories. For the past several seasons now, the cartoonist known only as Seth has been reviving this spooky old tradition with illustrated editions of these stories from the past. This year's series of three books includes The Doll's Ghost, Edith Wharton's Mr. Jones, and An Eddie on the Floor by Bernard Capes. The books are pocket-sized, or better yet, stocking-sized, hint hint. Check the show notes to this episode for a link, and check out my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds for photos. I'll come back at the end to wrap up and say goodbye. But for now, please enjoy The Doll's Ghost by F. Marion Crawford. It was a terrible accident. And for one moment, the splendid machinery of Cranston House got out of gear and stood still. The butler emerged from the retirement in which he spent his elegant leisure. Two grooms of the chambers appeared simultaneously from opposite directions. There were actually housemaids on the grand staircase, and those who remember the facts most exactly assert that Mrs. Pringle herself positively stood upon the landing. Mrs. Pringle was the housekeeper. And for the head nurse, the undernurse, and the nursery maid, their feelings could not be described. The head nurse laid one hand upon the polished marble balustrade and stared stupidly before her. The undernurse stood rigid and pale, leaning against the polished marble wall, and the nursery maid collapsed and sat down upon the polished marble step just beyond the limits of the velvet carpet, and frankly, burst into tears. The Lady Gwendolyn Lancaster Douglas Scroop, youngest daughter of the ninth Duke of Cranston, and aged six years and three months, picked herself up quite alone and sat down on the third step from the foot of the grand staircase of Cranston House. Oh, ejaculated the butler, and he disappeared again. Ah, responded the grooms of the chambers, as they went away also. It's only that doll, Mrs. Pringle was distinctly heard to say in a tone of contempt. The undernurse heard her say it. Then the three nurses gathered round Lady Gwendolyn and patted her and gave her unhealthy things out of their pockets and hurried her out of Cranston House as fast as they could, lest it should be found out upstairs that they had allowed the Lady Gwendolyn Lancaster Douglas Scroop to tumble down the grand staircase with her doll in her arms. And as the doll was badly broken, the nursery maid carried it with the pieces wrapped up in Lady Gwendolyn's little cloak. It was not far to Hyde Park, and when they had reached a quiet place, they took means to find out that Lady Gwendolyn had no bruises. For the carpet was very thick and soft, and there was thick stuff under it to make it softer. Lady Gwendolyn Douglas Scroop sometimes yelled, but she never cried. And it was because she had yelled that the nurse had allowed her to go downstairs alone with Nina, the doll, under one arm, while she steadied herself with her other hand on the balustrade and trod upon the polished marble steps beyond the edge of the carpet. So she had fallen, and Nina had come to grief. 
When the nurses were quite sure that she was not hurt, they unwrapped the doll and looked at her in her turn. She had been a very beautiful doll, very large and fair and healthy, with real yellow hair and eyelids that would open and shut over very grown-up dark eyes. Moreover, when you moved her right arm up and down, she said, Papa, and when you moved her left, she said, Mama, very distinctly. I heard her say Pa when she fell, said the undernurse, who had heard everything. That's because her arm went up when she hit the step, said the head nurse. She'll say the other Pa when I put the arm down again. Pa, said Nina, as the right arm was pushed down and speaking through her broken face. It was cracked right across from the upper corner of the forehead with a hideous gash through the nose and down to the frilled collar of the pale green Mother Hubbard frock, and two little three-cornered pieces of porcelain had fallen out. I'm sure it's a wonder she can speak at all being all smashed up, said the undernurse. You'll have to take her to Mr. Puckler, said her superior. It's not far, and you'd better go at once. Lady Gwendolyn was occupied in digging a hole in the ground with a little spade and paid no attention to the nurses. What are you doing? inquired the nursery maid, looking on. Nina's dead, and I'm digging her a grave, replied her ladyship thoughtfully. Oh, she'll come to life again all right, said the nursery maid. The undernurse wrapped Nina up again and departed. Fortunately, a kind soldier with very long legs and a very small cap happened to be there, and as he had nothing to do, he offered to see the undernurse safely to Mr. Puckler's and back. Mr. Bernard Puckler and his little daughter lived in a little house in a little alley which led off a quiet little street not very far from Belgrave Square. He was the great doll doctor, and his extensive practice lay in the most aristocratic quarter. He mended dolls of all sizes and ages. Boy dolls and girl dolls, baby dolls in long clothing, and grown-up dolls in fashionable gowns, talking dolls and dumb dolls, those that shut their eyes when they lay down, and those whose eyes had to be shut for them by means of a mysterious wire. His daughter Elsa was just over 12 years old, but she was already very clever at mending dolls' clothes and at doing their hair, which is harder than you might think, though the dolls sit quite still while it's being done. Mr. Puckler had originally been a German, but he had dissolved his nationality in the Ocean of London many years ago, like a great many foreigners. He still had one or two German friends, however, who came over on Saturday evenings and smoked with him and played piquet or scat with him for farthing points and called him Herr Doctor, which seemed to please Mr. Puckler very much. He looked older than he was, for his beard was rather long and ragged, his hair was grizzled and thin, and he wore horn-rimmed spectacles. As for Elsa, she was a thin, pale child, very quiet and neat with dark eyes and brown hair that was plaited down her back and tied with a bit of black ribbon. She mended the dolls' clothes and took the dolls back to their homes when they were quite strong again. The house was a little one, but too big for the two people who lived in it. There was a small sitting room on the street, and the workshop was at the back, and there were three rooms upstairs. But the father and daughter lived most of their time in the workshop because they were generally at work, even in the evenings. Mr. Puckler laid Nina on the table and looked at her a long time, till the tears began to fill his eyes behind the horn-rimmed spectacles. He was a very susceptible man, and he often fell in love with the dolls that he mended, and found it hard to part with them when they had smiled at him for a few days. They were real little people to him, with characters and thoughts and feelings of their own, and he was very tender with all of them. But some attracted him especially from the first, and when they were brought to him maimed and injured, their state seemed so pitiful to him that the tears came easily. You must remember that he had lived among dolls during a great part of his life, and he understood them. How do you know that they feel nothing, he went on to say to Elsa. You must be gentle with them. It costs nothing to be kind to the little beings, and perhaps it makes a difference to them. And Elsa understood him because she was a child, and she knew that she was more to him than all the dolls. He fell in love with Nina at first sight, perhaps because her beautiful brown glass eyes were something like Elsa's own, and he loved Elsa's first and best with all his heart. And besides, it was a very sorrowful case. Nina had evidently not been long in the world, for her complexion was perfect, her hair was smooth where it should be smooth, and curly where it should be curly, and her silk clothes were perfectly new. But across her face was that frightful gash, like a saber cut, deep and shadowy within, but clean and sharp at the edges. 
When he tenderly pressed her head to close the gaping wound, the edges made a fine grating sound that was painful to hear, and the lids of the dark eyes quivered and trembled as though Nina were suffering dreadfully. Poor Nina, he exclaimed sorrowfully, but I shall not hurt you much, though you will take a long time to get strong. He always asked the names of the broken dolls when they were brought to him, and sometimes the people knew what the children had called them and told him. He liked Nina for a name. Altogether and in every way, she pleased him more than any doll he had seen for many years, and he felt drawn to her and made up his mind to make her perfectly strong and sound no matter how much labor it might cost him. Mr. Puckler worked patiently a little at a time, and Elsa watched him. She could do nothing for poor Nina, whose clothes needed no mending. The longer the doctor worked, the more fond he became of the yellow hair and the beautiful brown glass eyes. He sometimes forgot all the other dolls that were waiting to be mended, lying side by side on a shelf, and sat for an hour gazing at Nina's face while he racked his ingenuity for some new invention by which to hide even the smallest trace of the terrible accident. She was wonderfully mended. Even he was obliged to admit that, but the scar was still visible to some keen eyes, a very fine line right across the face, downward from right to left. Yet all the conditions had been most favorable for a cure, since the cement had set quite hard at the first attempt and the weather had been fine and dry, which makes a great difference in a doll's hospital. At last he knew that he could do no more, and the under-nurse had already come twice to see whether the job was finished, as she coarsely expressed it. Nina is not quite strong yet, Mr. Puckler had answered each time, for he could not make up his mind to face the parting. And now he sat before the square deal table at which he worked, and Nina lay before him for the last time with a big brown paper box beside her. It stood there like a coffin, waiting for her, he thought. He must put her into it and lay tissue paper over her dear face, and then put on the lid, and at the thought of tying the string, his sight was dim with tears again. He was never to look into the glassy depths of the beautiful brown eyes anymore, nor to hear the little wooden voice say, Papa and Mama. It was a very painful moment. In the vain hope of gaining time before the separation, he took up the little sticky bottles of cement and glue and gum and color, looking at each one in turn, and then at Nina's face and all his small tools lay there, neatly arranged in a row, but he knew that he could not use them again for Nina. She was quite strong at last, and in a country where there should be no cruel children to hurt her, she might live a hundred years with only that most imperceptible line across her face to tell of the fearful thing that had befallen her on the marble steps of Cranston House. Suddenly, Mr. Puckler's heart was quite full, and he rose abruptly from his seat and turned away. Elsa he said unsteadily. You must do it for me. I cannot bear to see her go into the box. So he went and stood at the window with his back turned, while Elsa did what he had not the heart to do. Is it done? he asked, not turning round. Then take her away, my dear. Put on your hat and take her to Cranston House quickly, and when you are gone, I will turn round. Elsa was used to her father's queer way with the dolls, and though she had never seen him so much moved by a parting, she was not much surprised. Come back quickly, he said, when he heard her hand at the latch. It's growing late, and I should not send you at this hour, but I cannot bear to look forward to it any longer. When Elsa was gone, he left the window and sat in his place before the table again to wait for the child to come back. He touched the place where Nina had lain, very gently, and he recalled the soft tinted pink face and the glass eyes and the ringlets of yellow hair till he could almost see them. The evenings were long, for it was late spring, but it began to grow dark soon, and Mr. Puckler wondered why Elsa did not come back. She had been gone an hour and a half, and that was much longer than he had expected, for it was barely half a mile from Belgrave Square to Cranston House. He reflected that the child might have been kept waiting, but as the twilight deepened, he grew anxious and walked up and down in the dim workshop, no longer thinking of Nina, but of Elsa, his own living child, whom he loved. An undefinable, disquieting sensation came upon him by fine degrees. A chilliness and a faint stirring of his thin hair joined with a wish to be in any company rather than to be alone much longer. It was the beginning of fear. He told himself in strong German English that he was a foolish man, and he began to feel about for the matches in the dusk. 
He knew just where they should be, for he always kept them in the same place, close to the little tin box that held bits of sealing wax of various colors for some kinds of mending. But somehow, he could not find the matches in the gloom. Something had happened to Elsa, he was sure, and as his fear increased, he felt as though it might be allayed if he could get some light and see what time it was. Then he called himself a foolish old man again, and the sound of his own voice startled him in the dark. He could not find the matches. The window was gray, still. He might see what time it was if he went closer to it, and then he could go get the matches out of the cupboard afterwards. He stood back from the table to get out of the way of the chair and began to cross the board floor. Something was following him in the dark. There was a small pattering as of tiny little feet upon the boards. He stopped and listened, and the roots of his hair tingled. It was nothing, and he was a foolish old man. He made two steps more, and he was sure that he heard the little pattering again. He turned his back to the window, leaning against the sash so that the panes began to crack, and he faced the dark. Everything was quite still, and it smelt of paste and cement and wood fillings, as usual. "'Is that you, Elsa?' he asked, and he was surprised to hear fear in his voice. There was no answer in the room, and he held up his watch and tried to make out what time it was by the gray dusk that was just not darkness. So far as he could see, it was within two or three minutes of ten o'clock. He had been a long time alone." He was shocked and frightened for Elsa, out in London so late, and he almost ran across the room to the door. As he fumbled for the latch, he distinctly heard the running of the little feet after him. Mice, he exclaimed feebly, just as he got the door open. He shut it quickly behind him and felt as though some cold thing had settled on his back and were writhing upon him. The passage was quite dark, but he found his hat and was out in the alley in a moment, breathing more freely and surprised to find out how much light there still was in the open air. He could see the pavement clearly under his feet, and far off in the street to which the alley had led, he could hear the laughter and calls of children playing some game out of doors. He wondered how he could have been so nervous, and for an instant he thought of going back into the house to wait quietly for Elsa. But instantly he felt that nervous fright of something stealing over him again. In any case, it was better to walk up to Cranston House and ask the servants about the child. One of the women had perhaps taken a fancy to her and was even now giving her tea and cake. He walked quickly to Belgrave Square and then up the broad streets, listening as he went when there was no other sound for the tiny footsteps. But he heard nothing and was laughing at himself when he rang the servant's bell at the big house. Of course, the child must be there. The person who opened the door was a quite inferior person, for it was a back door, but affected the manners of the front and stared at Mr. Puckler superciliously under the strong light. No little girl had been seen, and he knew nothing about no dolls. "'She's my little girl,' said Mr. Puckler tremulously, for all his anxiety was returning tenfold. "'And I'm afraid something has happened.' The inferior person said rudely that nothing could have happened to her in that house because she had not been there, which was a jolly good reason why. And Mr. Puckler was obliged to admit that the man ought to know, as it was his business to keep the door and let people in. He wished to be allowed to speak to the under-nurse who knew him, but the man was ruder than ever and finally shut the door in his face. When the doll doctor was alone on the street, he steadied himself by the railing, for he felt as though he were breaking in two, just as some dolls break in the middle of the backbone. Presently, he knew that he must do something to find Elsa, and that gave him strength. He began to walk as quickly as he could through the streets, following every highway and byway which his little girl might have taken on her errand. He also asked several policemen in vain if they had seen her, and most of them answered him kindly, for they saw that he was a sober man and in his right senses, and some of them had little girls of their own. It was one o'clock in the morning when he went up to his own door again, worn out and hopeless and broken-hearted. As he turned the key and the lock, his heart stood still, for he knew that he was awake and not dreaming, and that he really heard those tiny footsteps pattering to meet him inside the house along the passage. But he was too unhappy to be much frightened anymore, and his heart went on again with a dull, regular pain that found its way all through him with every pulse. He went in and hung up his hat in the dark and found the matches in the cupboard and the candlestick in its place in the corner. Mr. Puckler was so much overcome and so completely worn out that he sat down in his chair before the work table and almost fainted as his face dropped forward upon his folded hands. 
Beside him, the solitary candle burned steadily with a low flame in the still warm air. Elsa, Elsa, he moaned against his yellow knuckles. And that was all he could say, and it was no relief to him. On the contrary, the very sound of the name was a new and sharp pain that pierced his ears and his head and his very soul. For every time he repeated the name, it meant that little Elsa was dead, somewhere in the streets of London, in the dark. He was so terribly hurt that he did not even feel something pulling gently at the skirt of his old coat, so gently that it was like the nibbling of a tiny mouse. He might have thought that it really was a mouse if he had noticed it. Elsa, Elsa, he groaned right against his hands. Then a cool breath stirred his thin hair, and the low flame of the one candle dropped down almost to a mere spark, not flickering as though a draft were going to blow it out, but just dropping down as if it were tired out. Mr. Puckler felt his hands stiffening with fright under his face, and there was a faint rustling sound, like some small silk thing blown in a gentle breeze. He sat up straight, stark and scared, and a small wooden voice spoke in the stillness. Papa, it said, with a break between the syllables. Mr. Puckler stood up in a single jump, and his chair fell over backward with a smashing noise upon the wooden floor. The candle was almost gone out. It was Nina's doll voice that had spoken, and he should have known it among the voices of a hundred other dolls. And yet, there was something more in it, a little human ring with a pitiful cry and a call for help and the wail of a hurt child. Mr. Puckler stood up, stark and stiff, and tried to look round, but at first he could not, for he seemed to be frozen from head to foot. Then he made a great effort, and he raised one hand to each of his temples, and pressed his own head round as he would have turned a doll's. The candle was burning so low that it might as well have been out altogether for any light it gave, and the room seemed quite dark at first. Then he saw something. He would not have believed that he could have been more frightened than he had been just before that. But he was, and his knees shook, for he saw the doll standing in the middle of the floor, shining with a faint and ghostly radiance, her beautiful glassy brown eyes fixed on his. And across her face, the very thin line of the break he had mended shone as though it were drawn in light with a fine point of white flame. Yet there was something more in the eyes, too. There was something human, like Elsa's own, but as if only the doll saw him through them, and not Elsa. And there was enough of Elsa to bring back all his pain and to make him forget his fear. Elsa, my Elsa, he cried aloud. The small ghost moved, and its doll arm slowly rose and fell with a stiff mechanical motion. Papa, it said. It seemed this time that there was even more of Elsa's tone echoing somewhere between the wooden notes that reached his ear so distinctly and yet so far away. Elsa was calling him, he was sure. His face was perfectly white in the gloom, and his knees did not shake any more, and he felt that he was less frightened. Yes, child, but where, where, he asked, where are you, Elsa? Papa. The syllables died away in the quiet room. There was a low rustling of silk, the glassy brown eyes turned slowly away, and Mr. Puckler heard the pitter-patter of the small feet and the bronze kid slippers as the figure ran straight to the door. Then the candle burned high again, and the room was full of light, and he was alone. Mr. Puckler passed his hand over his eyes and looked about him. He could see everything quite clearly, and he felt that he must have been dreaming, though he was standing instead of sitting, as he should have been if he had just waked up. The candle burned brightly now. There were dolls to be mended lying in a row with their toes up. The third one had lost her right shoe, and Elsa was making one. He knew that, and he was certainly not dreaming now. He had not been dreaming when he had come home from his fruitless search and had heard the doll's footsteps running to the door. He had not fallen asleep in his chair. How could he possibly have fallen asleep when his heart was breaking? He had been awake all the time. He steadied himself, set the fallen chair upon its legs, and said to himself again very emphatically that he was a foolish old man. He ought to be out in the streets looking for his child, asking questions and inquiring at the police stations where all accidents were reported as soon as they were known, or at the hospitals. Papa. The longing, wailing, pitiful little wooden cry rang from the passage outside the door, and Mr. Puckler stood for an instant with white face, transfixed and rooted on the spot. 
A moment later, his hand was on the latch. Then he was in the passage, with the light streaming from the open door behind him. Quite at the other end, he saw the little phantom shining clearly in the shadow, and the right hand seemed to beckon to him as the arm rose and fell once more. He knew all at once that it had not come to frighten him, but to lead him, and when it disappeared, he walked boldly toward the door. He knew that it was in the street outside waiting for him. He forgot that he was tired and had eaten no supper, and he walked many miles, for a sudden hope ran through and through him like a golden stream of life. And sure enough, at the corner of the alley and at the corner of the street and out in Belgrave Square, he saw the small ghost flitting before him. Sometimes it was only a shadow where there was no other light, but then the glare of the lamps made a pale green sheen on its little Mother Hubbard frock of silk, and sometimes where the streets were dark and silent, the whole figure shone out brightly with its yellow curls and rosy neck. It seemed to trot along like a tiny child, and Mr. Puckler could almost hear the pattering of the bronze kid slippers on the pavement as it ran. But it went very fast, and he could only just keep up with it, tearing along with his hat at the back of his neck and his thin hair blown by the night breeze, and his horn-rimmed spectacles set firmly upon his broad nose. On and on he went, and he had no idea where he was. He did not even care, for he knew certainly that he was going the right way. Then, at last, in a wide, quiet street, he was standing before a big, sober-looking door that had two lamps on each side of it and a polished brass bell handle, which he pulled. And just inside, when the door was opened, in the bright light there was the little shadow and the pale green sheen of the little silk dress, and once more the small cry came to his ears, less pitiful, more longing. Papa! The shadow turned suddenly bright, and out of the brightness the beautiful brown glass eyes were turned up happily to his, while the rosy mouth smiled so divinely that the phantom doll looked almost like a little angel just then. A little girl was brought in soon after ten o'clock, said the quiet voice of the hospital doorkeeper. I think they thought she was only stunned. She was holding a big brown paper box against her, and they could not get it out of her arms. She had a long plate of brown hair that hung down as she carried her. She's my little girl, said Mr. Puckler, but he hardly heard his own voice. He leaned over Elsa's face in the gentle light of the children's ward, and when he had stood there a minute, the beautiful brown eyes opened and looked up to his. Papa, cried Elsa softly, I knew you would come. Then Mr. Puckler did not know what he did or said for a moment, and what he felt was worth all the fear and terror and despair that had almost killed him that night. But by and by Elsa was telling her story, and the nurse let her speak, for there was only two other children in the room who were getting well and were sound asleep. They were big boys with bad faces, said Elsa, and they tried to get Nina away from me, but I held on and fought as well as I could till one of them hit me with something, and I don't remember any more, for I tumbled down, and I suppose the boys ran away, and somebody found me there. But I'm afraid Nina is all smashed. Here's the box, said the nurse. We could not take it out of her arms till she came to herself. Should you like to see if the doll is broken? And she undid the string cleverly, but Nina was all smashed to pieces. Only the little gentle light of the children's ward made a pale green sheen in the folds of the little Mother Hubbard frock. Well, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, this story is from 1896, and it first appeared in a Christmas supplement for the Illustrated London Times. Let me remind you to check out the show notes to this episode, where you can find more information about the new Biblioasis editions illustrated by the cartoonist Seth, and to come to my social media to see some pictures. Well, now that we're full swing into the Christmas season, you can look forward to new episodes coming out every couple days or so, so I'll see you again before you know it. Until then, let me remind you as always that Christmas Past is produced in wonderful Willow Glen, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. Again, do get in touch with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so we can stay connected all season long. And join our private Christmas Past Facebook group if you haven't yet. We've got plenty more episodes coming up that will include your Christmas memories, and there's still time for you to send one. All you have to do is record yourself speaking into your phone's voice memo app and then send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Just keep it reasonably short, clean and family-friendly, and be sure to say your name and where you're from. And if you're really feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people discover the show? It's as easy as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do leave a review, I'll send you a Christmas Past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card as my way of saying thanks. 
reach out for details on that. And until we meet again, may your days be merry and bright.